Calling all Woman Thou Art Loosed alumni. It's Woman's History Month, and we want to hear from you. On Sunday, March 15th, following service, you are invited to a free casting call to share your inspirational Woman Thou Art Loosed moments. Come and share your historical life-changing revelations and experiences that have influenced your own life over the years for chance to be featured in upcoming promotional media opportunities. To participate in the casting call on Sunday, March 15th, you must submit a brief summary of how your experiences of past Woman Now at Loose conferences have helped you shape history and impact your community at publicrelations at tdjakes.org. The deadline to submit your brief summary is Thursday, March 12th. I was reading an article, I received the offering at the end of the service, but I was reading an uh, article that, that uh, really kind of enhanced my message. The article didn't produce my message, it actually complemented my message, and I want uh, to, to just read just an excerpt out of The Federalist, uh, and, and I think it's gonna be quite helpful. Let me see, I'm gonna read it out of my uh, pad. It's, it's just an excerpt. It's, it, let me put it in context so it makes sense. The, the, the article is about the exiting from religious institutions of uh, the millennial generation. That the increasing number of millennials allegedly, according to the article, declare themselves as nuns. And uh, while I have a lot of feelings about the accuracy of that, I'm not sure whether they are so much uh, exiting uh, faith in Christ as much as they are developing an aversion to organized religion. <clears throat> but for the purposes of the article, they could not differentiate between the shifts that we see going on in church attendance as opposed to the, it having a bearing on your relationship with God. That is to say that they associate Christianity with buildings. I do not, because Christ never saw a church like this. <laughs> and the early church didn't see this. They met outside and in houses. Our faith cannot be locked up behind walls. And, <laughs> yeah. Nevertheless, the statement is nonetheless true that there has been a decline amongst most groups, not all, not really ours, but there has been a decline in church attendance on the basis of, of this group, this growing group of people who call themselves nuns. They don't want to be labeled. They don't want to be classified. Uh, and that's, but that's not just true about religion. That's true about politics. That's true about education, it's true. Every institution is having to shift and is thinking about how we feed the flock of God because all of them are not gathered in contemporary walls. Some are gathered online. You see, they have new ways of ingesting information. Restaurants are having to adjust. Target is having to adjust. Those that do not adjust collapse. J.C. Penney's going down. Sears going down. We're seeing a worldwide shift in all institutions. It does not negate the efficacious power of the blood of the Lamb. It's just a season and a time that we're going through. So anyway, let me go back to what they said, leave what I said alone. They said the flip side of this is that religious and married parents nurture substantially more children than do unmarried and unreligious parents. And of the children of parents who show, watch this, of the children of parents who show very high commitment to religious practices such as religious education, reading scripture at home, and church attendance, 93% remained in the faith as adults. In, in other words, the whole precipitous of the article built around the fact if the millennials declined in their attendance, it's because the boomers didn't carry their kids to church. So they're saying that if you, if you change what your children see, you can change what your children will become. It goes on to say this means the nuns phenomenon will soon peak and begin to die out. 
in 2017, the Pew forecasted that by 2060, nuns will be a shrinking share of the world population and the world's future will be more apt to attend local church services. And I couldn't help but think about it in my own life. I was asking some young people coming up in the elevator. Uh, I said, uh, tell me about your parents. And they said, my, my parents go to this church. My parents raised me up in church. I've been in church all my life. That's also my experience as well. I watched it the way we raised our children. It was not uncommon for you to see us pray over food. It was not uncommon for you to see their mother in particular praying for them in the morning before they sent them off to school. Let us not lay the entire responsibility for Christian development on the church. The real impact of faith happens in what you do in your house. And when children see you honor God in the house, I mean just to bless the food, to pray when you're going through trouble, to see you grab their hands in the morning and send them off with a brief word of prayer. Little things like that instill values in children. And what it really boils down, while you may be mentored at church, what you are modeled at home will override what you are mentored do y'all hear what I'm saying to you? So I want you to think about that. I want you to hold that. And I want to, everything that I'm saying of late is really centered around bringing Christ out of the church into your house, into your car, into your life, into your iPad. I want to be able to look down your Twitter line and see some Jesus uh, in your Twitter line. I want to be able to go on your Instagram and see the pictures line up with the picture you showed me on Sunday morning. I don't want to see... They told me not to say that, so I'm not going to say that. You know, some of them handles you got conflict with how I know you, and I'm shocked when I see the handle because it don't match up with the sister that I just saw running all over the church. We, uh, it got quiet for a minute. Some of y'all changing your handles right now because you didn't know I was looking, but I've been peeking, checking you out. We want to bring down the inconsistencies between Sunday and Monday where you are not just somebody who goes to church on Sunday, but you have had an encounter, a real meaningful experience with God. And it begins when you see God differently than just a police officer over your behavior and you really do see him as a family member. That's why Jesus said, when you pray, start out by saying, our Father. He didn't say our God, our ruler, our master. He is all of that, but he wanted you to feel the intimacy of a relationship with God rather than the religious responsibility of a relationship with God. It's not at all about religion. It's all about relationship. Oh, you ought to be shouting me down. Anyway, I'm going to go to the Word of God. I'm going to be in 1 Samuel chapter 3, verse 1 through 4. I'm just going to read a few passages. I'm not even going to exegete the entirety of the story. There's just something that caught my eye uh, in this very familiar story. I love this text. I'm scared to get too deep into it because I could stay too long. I could spend the night in this text, baby. Boy, both in my personal life and my spiritual life, this text has fed me in ways I can't even begin to explain. Sometime at your leisure, read through the, the whole chapter. It's, it is, we, we are looking at, well, let me go into it and I'll show you what we're looking at. The boy Samuel ministered before the Lord under Eli. In those days, the word of the Lord was rare. There were not many visions. One night, Eli, whose eyes were becoming so weak that he could barely see, was lying down in his usual place. The lamp of God had not yet, had not yet gone out. And Samuel was lying down in the house of the Lord where the ark of God was. Then the Lord called Samuel. Samuel answered, here I am. Can you say amen? amen? I want to talk about in flickering light. What stands out to me in the King James Version, it is translated, and ere the lamp of God went out. 
God calls Samuel in flickering light. You know how it is when a candle's about to go out or an oil lamp is about to go out and you've run out of oil and it's down to the last little bit and the light begins to flicker. It is, it's the flicker I'm after. It's not really Samuel. It's not really Eli. It's, it's the flickering that drew my fascination. Father God, in the name of Jesus, I stand before you today because there is no other God I can stand before. You alone are God, and besides you, there is no other. And it is with great humility that I stand in your presence today for no other reason but to honor you and to appreciate you and to thank you and to acknowledge that I am literally standing in your grace. I have both feet in your mercy. And it is by that mercy that we are not consumed. As we share the bread of life today, let it be so powerful and so profound and so prolific. Not that I am recognized, but that you are recognized. That hell is horrified. That demons tremble. That sickness flees the room. I thank you, Lord, for even weariness and tiredness leaving out of our body. I thank you for nervousness and stress taking wings and flying out of the room. I trust you over the next few moments to give bread to the eater. You don't have to feed somebody who refuses to be fed, but Father, give bread to the eater. Uh, wherever they are, whether they're in the church or sitting on the couch, give bread to the eater and seed to the sower. I thank you in advance for what you're going to do. Have your way in this place. In Jesus' name, somebody shout amen. amen. You may be seated. Yeah, let's go to work, man. The Bible teaches us clearly about the purpose of God. It has a lot to say about the purpose of God. And when it begins to tell us about the purpose of God, much has been written about it, much has been sung about it, much has been said about it. I myself have shared and taught series on the purpose of God, included it in my books and shared it through the resources that are available to you, letting you know that you are not an incident or an accident or a mistake, that you are intentional, that God thought you here. <laughs> yeah, that, that's a good one right there. God thought you here. That's why that particular sperm cell outswam all the rest because you were chosen before you were born. So why would you now think that the choice is based on you? Since you were selected from the very beginning, God says it this way, before I formed thee in thy, in the, thy mother's womb, I knew thee and I ordained thee to be a prophet unto the nations. Before you had Bible study, before you had class, before you cleaned up your life, before you got baptized, before you even knew who God was, God selected you. Now the circumstances surrounding your birth may not have been ideal, but environments are irrelevant to choice. In fact, God has a way of picking the most unlikely people to do the most amazing things. But whenever such discussions emerge and we begin to talk about that, those things, a lot of times on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, I start getting questions back from the little clips they pray that says, uh, Bishop, uh, this unearths my uncertainty. It exists in many of us because we have great musings and confusions about what is God's purpose for my life? Am I on the right track or not? Am I doing what God called me to do? Am I serving the way God wants me to serve? Am I in the right city? Did I move to the right house? Did I get the right companion? Did I get this, that, or the other? And, and we, we carry purpose into minutia. You know, sh should I be a cashier or a manager? If it has nothing to do with outcomes, it is all left up to you. That is to say, God doesn't care whether you bought the blue house or the white one. As long as it doesn't affect your purpose or your destiny, God doesn't care. 
It's, it's like me and my GPS system when I'm driving in a strange place. Okay, I admit it. I use it even in Dallas. <laughs> but what gets on my nerves about the GPS system is that sometimes she talks too much. Okay. And I think, shut up, I know this part. And then other times she talks too little because I'm driving through a place of uncertainty. And uncertainty scares me. And I need her to reaffirm me by saying, you know, they need to add something like, you're on the right track. <laughs> Don't worry, it's only five miles away, just keep going. But the propensity of the GPS system is not to talk unless it affects destination. Are you hearing what I'm saying to you? And see, what I want you to think from a God perspective is that purpose for your life didn't begin with you. And this is what I love about God. This is one of the ways I try to be like God is to be strategic because God is a strategist. Purpose didn't begin when you got converted. Purpose didn't begin when you were born. Purpose has been set in place from generation to generation. The stage is set before the call begins. <laughs> if you will remember, Samuel's mother, Hannah, had a barren womb. Now, understand when we start talking about barren wombs, barren wombs speak to the same thing that hungers, that hunger does. The Bible says, he that hungers and thirsts after righteousness shall be filled. So attitude has something to do with altitude. God says, I'm not going to force feed you. You have to want this. The barrenness of his mother created an urgency and appreciation for a child. And if it had not been enough alone, he sent Panina along to provoke her to model what success looks like. Because a lot of times, if you don't know what success looks like, you will settle for okay. If you're waiting for me to preach, I already started. He created the environment of discomfort that would ultimately drive Samuel's mother, Hannah, into the presence of God. Now, I want you to hear that because I want you to understand that God is not a flight attendant. He is not there for your comfort. God who creates comfort, whose Holy Spirit is the comforter, is also the God of discomfort. Be choosing which tool he needs to use to shift you into the purpose and place of destiny. If comfort doesn't do it, God will make you uncomfortable where you are, however you define discomfort, to create an environment that shifts you. My GPS yells at me, make the turn. <laughs> she said, get in the middle lane, get in the right lane, and I'm in the right lane. This tells me what exit to get off, and then when I get up to it, in case she thinks I'm blind or something, make the turn, make the turn, like she's going to jump out of the car and beat me up. <laughs> God says, I will make you uncomfortable before I will let you miss a turn. So, so, so let's, let's look at it this way a minute. I'm, I'm going to give you another scripture. I'll put up Romans 8, 28 through 30. And, and some of you could probably quote it, but, but it's important to the setup for what I'm about to say. For we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose, who have been what? Called. According to his what? So there's a line of connectivity between call and purpose. I was upstairs and telling them, uh, uh, Brenda Ellis was singing that first song with the choir. I said, how do these singers remember all these words to all these songs? I can't think of a song to save my life. I can sing about two lines and then the rest of it is created. But I can quote scriptures in my sleep. 
I can remember messages I preached when I was 25 years old. The whole sermon, the outline and everything is still in my head. Now the reason I can't do what they do is because God has said, make the turn, make the turn. Because I thought I was called to gospel music. I grew up playing the piano and directing the choir. And if God hadn't forced me to make the turn, I would have been somewhere in the choir. I can't play well enough to be in the band, but I would have been somewhere in the choir singing something. But the Holy Ghost said, make the turn, make the turn, make the turn, because you are called according to he said, I'll send you somebody to play for you. I'll send you somebody to sing for you. I know you like music, but that's not what I want you to do. I predestined you to do something else. And some of the things that you think of the devil, it's really God saying, make the turn, make the turn, make the turn. I know you don't want to do it, but make the turn, make the turn, make the turn, make the turn. Shut your mouth. He will whip you into silence. He will whip you into submission. He will drive you away from your insecurities. Make the turn. Make the turn. He'll give courage to the discouraged. He'll give strength to them that are faint. Order to make you make the turn in time. Then it says in verse 29, for those God foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed. But those, oh wow, wait, wait, wait. For those God foreknew, I ain't going to get into it. Those God foreknew, he knew me, foreknew, he means he knew me before. <laughs> he, he knew me before, isn't that amazing? He knew, so how could I surprise him? You might surprise you, you might surprise your mama, you might surprise your church, you might surprise your friend, but how, you, how could you surprise a God who foreknew you? God says, I know your thoughts are far off. Before they even get to your head, I see them coming. Those he did foreknew, he also predestined. He, those that he foreknew, he predestined. He already set up the stage. Now watch this. I want you to get this. He foreknew me and he predestined me without me. So I don't remember his foreknowledge because I don't have foreknowledge. So I can't bear witness to his foreknowledge other than the word of God because I was not cognizant of the fact that while I was still in my daddy's loins, God foreknew me. But the Bible says that Levi paid tithes to Melchizedek while he was still in the loins of Abraham. That means when I pay tithes, I bless my sperm cells, my seeds, my children I, that hadn't even come out yet. God said, I already bless them in their father. He foreknew you. He foreknew you. Well, I didn't like my father. I don't care. If it accomplishes the purpose of God, God will use a sewer rat. God will use a whore named Harlot. God will use an ass and give him the ability to speak in order to accomplish his purpose. His purpose trumps every problem in your life. For those God foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son, to be conformed. Conforming is uncomfortable. You can't form a clay vase without pushing on it without pulling on it, without applying pressure. I would suggest to you that most of what you call demonic and attack and spiritual warfare is just the potter pushing on the clay. <laughs> to be conformed to the image of his son that he might be, that he might be the firstborn among many brothers and sisters. For those he predestined, he also called. Now this is when it gets good. Though all the foreknowledge and all the predestination he did without my knowledge, and then when he calls me, he brings me into a setup 
that was already set up. Uh, you don't know my setup. My setup wasn't good. You're not listening at what I'm saying. It doesn't have to feel good to be God. <laughs> For those he predestined, he also called. And because I knew you would mess things up, those he called, he also justified. Those he justified, he also glorified. So, so I, pre I predetermined the end from the beginning because I knew you. And I knew exactly where to push you to make you move cities. <laughs> I knew exactly where to push you to make you join churches. I knew exactly where to push you to shift you into a destiny move. I knew exactly where to push you to force you to have a hunger to take the right courses in the right schools to prepare your mind for what I'm going to do in your life. And hear this, nothing that you have been through shall be wasted. I'm going to tell y'all over here because y'all look more spiritual than that group over there. Nothing that you have been through shall be wasted. Not one tear, not one sorrow, not one agony, not one mistake, not one misfortune, not one accident. Nothing that you have been through shall be wasted. Jonah, you're a real good prophet. I'm going to send you to Nineveh. I'm not going to Nineveh. I'm going to Tarshish. Go ahead and go to Tarshish. I'm going to use that too. Go ahead and run. I'm going to use your running away from me for my glory. I'm going to let the fish swallow you up and leave you at the bottom of the mountains for three days and bring you out just so Christ can come along and say, even as Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days, so shall the Son of Man be in the lower parts of the earth. Your pain is a shadow of my power. And oh my God. But in a narcissistic society where you think everything is about you, you fail to understand that God has been setting you up before you even existed. You don't bring the actor on and then set the stage. You set the stage before the scene is executed. You don't, in the film business, you don't even shoot the movie in sequence. If it's convenient and budgetary convenient, you may shoot the last scene before you shoot the first scene, and then in the editing suite, you cut it till it all fits together to come into the ending that has been predestined from the beginning. Oh, y'all don't hear me. Are you with me? You doing okay? So we enter into the text at the point of the unveiling of the purpose of God for Samuel's life. It's not the beginning of the story. This is when he comes into the awareness of what God has predestined and foreknown in his life. Making decisions about me without me, the call is when I become aware of who I am in him. Are you following me good? Up until this moment, all Samuel knows is religion. He, if you read down in the text, you will find that Samuel knew religion before he knew relationship. Be careful don't, that you don't feed people religion to hide the fact that you don't have relationship. A lot, a lot of the cute preaching that you see today uses a lot of metaphors and a lot of social colloquialisms to hide the fact that I don't study. 
people have a way of covering for their inadequacies that if they razzle dazzle you with this, you won't notice that I really didn't develop that. We have this young man working in the temple and the Bible clearly says that he does not know the Lord. That means evangelism doesn't start out there. Sometimes you have to convert the converted. Because we're all in here, but some of us have taken placebos. Now all the doctors know exactly what I'm talking about when I say placebo. Everybody got a pill, you can't tell which pill they got, but some of them have a placebo so you can get an honest assessment of the effectiveness of the medication. Everybody's sitting here, but everybody's not getting the word. Some are getting a placebo because they're not really focused on the word of God. They just want to say they went to church. Oh, I'm just warming up. I haven't even gotten to the point yet. But a fiery test will tell whether you took the medication or whether you have a placebo. People lying on you will let you know whether you got the real deal or you got a placebo. If your feelings can get hurt and you quit, you didn't really have an encounter with God. You had an encounter with me. But oh, if you got an encounter with God, Yes, if you got an encounter with God, you'll stay with him when he's pushing on the clay. You'll stay with him when he's pulling you into places that you don't feel comfortable in. You'll stay with him when friends surround you. You'll stay with him when friends leave you. You'll stay with him when everybody loves you. You'll stay with him when everybody hates you because my soul has been anchored my soul is not anchored in our friendship. My soul is not anchored in a paycheck. My soul is not anchored in my car. My soul is not anchored in my house. My soul. Y'all don't hear what I'm saying. My soul has been anchored in the Lord. Don't stop. Keep on raging. Huh. All right, look at your neighbor and say something's about to happen. I feel it in the room, I feel it in the atmosphere, I feel it in the environment, I feel that something is about to happen. This is that tipping point in our church where the Holy Ghost kicks in and begins to do amazing stuff. And if you've been asleep through the rest, don't miss this because something is about to happen. I want to invite you to shout with us till you can be like us. Somewhere along the way, God will find you. Somewhere along the way, God will touch you. Somewhere along the way, God will heal you. I just got to my first point. <laughs> All that other stuff, that was just a frame. Now I'm gonna set the picture in. The young boy named Samuel has come up in the church knowing the rituals, knowing the ceremonies, knowing the routines, knowing his responsibility in the church, but has not really had an encounter with God. His mother has taken him at an early age when he's just been weaned and brought him up in, in, in a religious environment, and he knows how to be religious. He knows how to raise his hands. He knows how to clap on and off beat, depending. He, he knows the words to the songs. He doesn't even have to look at the screen. He's in. God has put him in an environment that suggests an encounter with God, 
that actually is flickering. It is a, he has been born into a time, what I call a flickering era of enlightenment. The Bible says it this way, this way, he says the word of the Lord was scarce in those days and there was no open vision. Now this, this first sentence, and I'm quoting, I read it out of NIV, but I'm quoting out of King James because I'm old. <laughs> when I started preaching, we didn't have NIV. So I learned it in KJV. The Bible says the word of the Lord was scarce in those days and there was no open vision. This first verse does not deal with Eli, the temple, but the sociological environment that surrounds the community that he lives in, his worldview of God. For years I've pondered in my mind does the church affect culture or does culture affect the church? I know we're the salt of the earth and we're supposed to affect the culture, but we cannot live autonomously and isolate ourselves and not confess that the culture also affects the church. Because we are limited to simple things like language in the conveyance of language Language creates words, but it doesn't control pictures. So when I say our father to somebody who had a good one, oh, I'm going to help you to see it. They get a warm feeling, but when I say our father to somebody who was beaten every day, they say, so even though we convey the same words, we don't get the same pictures, and it is actually the pictures that teach us. <laughs> so that's why all of us can hear the same message and everybody walks out with something different it's because my words form different pictures based on your world view I'm amazed I went through a time pastor uh, I was trying to be like my friend Archie Dennis who's deceased now I went to Archie's church and after church he would ask his members what they got out of the message and each of them would stand and t tell what they got out of the message. So I went back to my church in West Virginia, and I, I said, so what did you get out of the message? It depressed me so bad <laughs> that I said, either I got to stop this or I got to stop preaching. This is, this is just, this, this is just uh, you know, I was about 28 or so, and I, I couldn't understand out of all that I studied and prepared and, and meant to convey that they walked away with, you know, you, it was a witness to leave my husband. No, baby, you heard what you wanted to hear because you came in here with your mind on leaving him and now you're using my message to justify your behavior. I did not say that. You heard that. So this is a flickering era of enlightenment. And I want to go back to that. I want to talk about that a little bit. The, the environment around it, the, the Bible says that the word of the Lord was scarce. The, the word of the Lord was scarce. So it wasn't that there wasn't any light. It was flickering. And there was no open vision. In other words, NIV says not many visions. It wasn't that there weren't any, but they were scarce, flickering. The problem with being born in a flickering environment. It's not just that the light is flickering, it is also that a flickering light is normal. And, 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 and to, to <laughs> I, 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 I wanna bring out this point, I grew up poor. I grew up, I, I realized in retrospect we were poor. Girl, that's my sister. <laughs> I got a witness. We was poor. We couldn't afford the last O and R to pronounce it correctly. We were poor. The reason I know I was poor is because when I went to school and they had spaghetti sauce, I didn't know what it was. Because my mama put hot ketchup. It ain't that bad if that's all you know. 
You, you, you don't hear me. It's not that bad if that's all you know. And, and TV wasn't like it is today, and there wasn't no social media, and so we didn't get to compare ourselves with everybody else. It was only as I got out of my environment that I began to understand that what I thought was true wasn't as true as I thought, because isolation always affects education. You see, as long as women couldn't drive, they, 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 as long as they couldn't drive and all they could see was a kitchen, they stayed in a kitchen. But when they messed around and got driver's license, now they said, wait a minute, I want to be able to vote. I want to be able to work. Now they said, I want to be president of the United States because isolation affects education. And that's why the more you're exposed, the more you want to change. And whenever God wants to change a thing, he will start a change way back here to affect something that's going to happen up here. Some of the breakthroughs that God's going to give you in your life are not for you, they're for your children and for your children's children. Look at your neighbor and say, it's about to shift. That shift is bigger than me. It's my kids. It's my grandkids. It's my great, great grandkids. I played my part in a shift. Whew. I'm going somewhere. You going with me? Now, we, we now understand that the environment around him does not expect much. And God is getting ready to do much. So, so Samuel coming into the temple is not just another prophet coming along to speak in that environment, though the word of the Lord was scarce in those days. It's, it's a paradigm shift. It's bigger than this one guy, but it starts with him. What is God trying to start with you? It'll never happen if your goal is to fit in. God didn't call you to fit in. He called you to stand out. Stop trying to fit in with people who don't want you anyway. God wants you to be your own person and stand on your own two feet in spite of your circumstances, in spite of your environment, in spite of your situation. God wants you to stand up and be the man and the woman that he called you to be. Away with what the people say. Away with what they said about you. Away with what you heard. Stand up. Who am I talking to this morning? They started singing that song, it really blessed me, because it started talking about a shift. And whenever you hear a shift, you think next week. <laughs> but you don't understand, God has started the shift before the prophet ever opened up his eyes. We are comparing Samuel, who is a prophet, to the environment of Eli, who is a priest. There are two different jobs in the same place. The prophet is to declare, thus saith the Lord. But he's been raised up around priests who are there to minister to the people and be the voice of the people to God in repentance, in prayer. So Samuel has the benefit of being softened by being ministered and trained by the priests. Are you following what I'm saying? Now, 
His world is flickering. His mentors are too. The second verse says, Eli, eyes had grown dim. This, this flickering priest, <laughs> this flickering priest, he, he's not all gone, but he's not all there. He's not blind, but his eyes are dim. He has not always been dim. Or the Bible wouldn't have said his eyes grew dim. So it is possible to start out with 2020. And over time and over life, his eyes grew dim. Later we will find out that his hearing is bad. He can hear Samuel better than he can hear God. See, Eli has been serving a long time. Now I'm going to say something, and I don't mean this as a generalization. This is why it's not always good. Not all grandparents should be raising children. You just shouldn't. Because your eyes grow dim. You are to, you got to go bring this filth in my house. The kid got a cell phone, Grandma. <laughs> They're not bringing in brown paper bags anymore. You, you, but she, she don't know where to fight because no matter who you are, over time, your eyes grow dim and you put up with stuff that you wouldn't put up with and you take stuff that you wouldn't take and, and the, the priesthood, the whole, the whole institution can suffer from men who stayed in power too long. Oh God, make me hear. I'm trying to hear it, but the more I feed, the more he feeds. Why do we stay too long? Why do we hold on? I'll tell you why we hold on. Because we think positions define us. And, and we think if they don't call you a policeman, you're not anybody. If they don't call you a pastor, you're not anybody. If they don't call you executive admin, you're not anybody. You have allowed the title to eat up who you are. The title doesn't make the person. The person makes the title. But if you're not careful, you will cleave to things out of season and kill yourself trying to be what you used to be rather than to release yourself and enjoy every season of your life. So we have a, we, we, we have a flickering point of connection with God. And, and the church has suffered from it. Eli's sons are out of control. It's hard to control grown kids. It ain't easy controlling the little ones. The older they get, the, the more opinionated they become. You used to lay out what the baby was gonna wear, baby didn't say nothing. Wait a while. I'm not wearing that. I don't like that color. That's not what they're wearing at my school. The longer you live, the less you can control. Oh, I'm preaching some stuff. His, his sight had grown to flickering. His ears had gotten bad. And yet it is in this environment that God does his best work. If I was God, I should stop right there. Because <laughs> I'm going down the wrong road already. If I was God, y'all should really be scared. <laughs> but if I was God, 
I would bring the perfect man out of the perfect environment. But because God's strength is made perfect in weakness, God will give you a flickering environment, give you a flickering mentor, and yet bring something out of you that changes the world. You wouldn't think that, 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 that Eli had any value because he couldn't hardly see. He was almost deaf. He had grown dim. Isn't it funny how people want you till you grow dim? That's why you can't get addicted to the applause. Because as, as you continue on, things change. And the love they say they have for you is not for you, it's for what you produce. When you get where you can't produce what you used to produce, you'd be surprised how fast people will drop you. Hophni and Phinehas were able to escape his judgment. They were doing their own thing. They were going in their own way. You later see that he didn't understand the voice. Of God. Wait, 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 wait. Let me correct that. The oxymoron in the story is that when God calls Samuel, Samuel can hear it, but he doesn't understand it. This is the problem with the young. They can hear things they don't understand. <laughs> so all of a sudden, you see me do something, and you say, I can do that. <laughs> and you saw it, but you don't understand what all is behind this. <laughs> all you see is what's happening right now. You don't see all the things that went on for weeks and weeks behind the scenes. You don't see the staff operating. You don't see the volunteers operating. You don't see the lawsuits. You don't see the crisis management. You don't see the budget. You don't see the circumstances. You don't see the bills. You don't understand the insurance we got to pay. You don't understand the rules that we have to amend to. You don't understand what all is behind it. But all you see is the suit. And, and you see the collar, and you walk around here, you get you some glasses, and you start walking around, you say, I got this. Yeah. Really? <laughs> I can dress like Emmett, but I can't run like Emmett. I can't do what Emmett did. It's an insult yes. to the profession yes. to underestimate how much it costs to participate. Yes. You don't come when it rains. <laughs> you don't come when the Super Bowl is on. You don't have the commitment yet. But you have the gift. <laughs> you have the gift. So, so don't, don't get rid of Eli because his eyes have grown dim. And it is true, he's gotten weak. He lets things go down that he would have stood up against. You get tired. You get tired of fighting people. Half nine Phineas is acting a fool like they lost their mind. Eli is old now. He's just trying to make it on in. <laughs> he's just trying to make it on in. But don't devalue him. He doesn't hear well but he understands well. Samuel could hear God, but he didn't know what it meant. Eli knew what it meant, but he could no longer hear. God brings people into your life because you need them. Don't be so caught up in what you can do better than them that you don't understand that you still need them because every gift got a blind spot. Every gift got a blind spot. Every gift got a blind spot. Our head of counseling will tell you, there comes a, I can counsel you as a pastor, and I'm, I think I'm pretty good at it. I think I'm real good at it. But there comes a point in complexity that I will come over and tag you and say, this is one for you. You got to understand your limitations. It doesn't mean you're not valuable, but you have to understand where gifts are not enough to take you the last mile of the way. And if you don't understand when to get out, you will hurt people that you're trying to help. That's why I encourage all husbands and all wives 
to stop trying to be your spouse's pastor. Because you're trying to help, but you're going to kill them. You can't be their therapist. You can't be their counselor. You can't, you, sometimes you can't even be their mentor, even though it means well. Pastor, she just won't hear me. What you talking about? Now you had one scripture you quoted backwards because y'all was in an argument. And you, you haven't been doing this long enough to look at the whole picture. You don't read your Bible. You just write stuff out of my sermon and try to repeat it. And you take an excerpt to manipulate the thing in your house. You haven't done it from a perspective of, of not having a personal investment in it, so your wisdom is blurred by what you are trying to make me become. Eli had grown old. Samuel is about to hear the call that's going to change his life. It's going to change the priesthood. It's going to change the nation of Israel. It's going to change the world as they know it. It's going to happen to a young man who didn't even know God until this moment. He had been predestined. He had been foreknown, but he didn't know it. Wonder what you don't know about who you are. I preached a message a couple of months ago. I didn't know who I was. If I'd have known who I was, I'd have done things differently. I didn't know this was going to happen to me. It just happened. It's not like God came in there and gave me a full-scale report that this is where your life is going to be at this age. It would have changed some stuff I did at 19 and 20 and 30 and a little bit at 40. And <laughs> <laughs> you understand? I never will forget uh, Cornell West and I debated each other many years ago at Princeton. And I was debating Cornell West and they were quoting passages that I wrote out of my first book, Woman Now Loose. And I told him, when I wrote that book, I wasn't talking to Princeton. <laughs> I didn't write you that with you all in mind. I wrote that with my church in mind. That was my worldview. And so it's one thing to take truth that is true in this environment and try to put it on that environment. Wonder who you are. Wonder, could you have an encounter in this temple that changed the trajectory of your life? That shifted everything, that explained your past, that explored your childhood, they got deep down into the questions in your life. And then you begin to understand, that's why I read Romans 8, 28, how all things work together for the good of them that love the Lord, who are the called according to his purpose. And then you start saying, so it was good for me that I was afflicted. Had I not been afflicted, I would have never seen it was good, it was good, it was good. Look at somebody say, it was good, it was good, it was good, it was good. What I call bad, it was good, it was good, it was good we was born poor. It was good daddy taught us a worth ethic. It was good that mama educated us at home. It was good that we didn't have fancy clothes to wear. It stopped us from being proud. It stopped us from being arrogant. It made us able to reach all kinds of people. I'm glad. It made me tough. It made me strong. It made me independent of what you think. I'm not used to you liking me no way. So I can't lose what I've never had. Somebody talk to me up in here. Somebody talk to me up in here. Somebody talk to me up in here. Somebody 
Yes. It was good that they didn't like me on the school bus. It was good that they rejected me. God taught me how to be isolated. He taught me how to make myself happy. It was good that we couldn't buy toys. It made me creative. Anytime you can go out and play in the woods with a, oh, y'all don't hear what I'm saying? And you can get an old stick and a, and a rock and a ball and a bat and get out in the woods and create stuff. It made me creative. It made me inventive. It made me strong. It made me see things that were not there. It was good. It was good. What you have been calling bad, you ought to start calling it good. God leaves Eli in the world just long enough to influence who's next. Yeah, y'all made me sweat this morning. This ain't Corona. This is Christos. Come on, talk to me, somebody. This is Jesus fever. I want you to catch this. Hey, hey! I want you to catch this. I'm gonna brag on you a little bit, honey. There's a lot I can brag on, but I'm gonna brag on this. My wife is meticulous. She's meticulous even when she don't have to be meticulous. As we get older and things get harder, I tell her I don't take all that. Because we f flicker in. And, and, and she still won't bring me a meal without a placemat. If I want sucking, she'll never bring it on a dirty plate. I think, don't give me another plate. I ain't got time for that. Just throw some food over top of it. It's, it's all going to the same place. It's going to be all right. When she ain't there, I do little nasty stuff. <laughs> Eat the food right out the refrigerator. Go heat it up. Drag a little saucepan back into the bedroom. Got a spoon in the saucepan. When she coming back home, I gotta clean up so she can't see what a heathen I really am. I'm an animal. I'm an animal. I don't like it till it's nasty and messy and everything. She, she picks up everything. It, it'd be so nice. I always know when she's home because when I come in the house, I smell the candles. Yeah, and when I know she's been gone, I try to do like her. I be lighting candles <laughs> too late. The room smell like fried fish. <laughs> I've always been, I was the one who could cook. She couldn't cook when I married her. I was the one who could cook. So she always set the table. Now she do, do it all. <laughs> you know, she do it all. She made a cobbler the other day. The cobbler was so good it made me mad. Cause I always did the desserts. So I said, wait a minute. You have gone too far now. <laughs> And after I got my ego under control, I said, what did you put in that? <laughs> <laughs> she uh, thinks the table should be made right. And so when she set the table, she'll put a candle opera or something on the table or some flowers on the table and she'll decorate the table, especially when we're doing something, you know, worthy of it. And, and it'll be the centerpiece. And, and what you have to understand yeah. 
What you have to understand is that for me, the centerpiece of this text The centerpiece of this text is not Hophni nor Phineas. They may be at the table, but they're not the text. It's, it's not Eli, not even Samuel. They, they're at the table, but they're not the text. The centerpiece, which is never something you eat. But it sets the atmosphere for the evening. The atmosphere for this text is set by a footnote in the author's writing that says, and ere the lamp of God went out, that, that, that as the light flickers, Samuel heard God call him in flickering light. I'm too young, Lord. I'm too old, Lord. I'm not ready, Lord. I can't do this, Lord. God said, I'm going to call you in flickering light. Now, you must understand that it was Samuel's job to keep the light burning. But at night, there was this, this, this period where the light would flicker and even the priest had to rest. And the writer notes what time it was by telling us where the light was. And ere the lamp of God went out, just before it went out, that's what it means, just before it went out, as it began to flicker, God calls Samuel. And the Lord told me to tell you that the world around you is flickering. And that he has mighty men of valor and women of valor that he has used in mighty ways, but alas, they too have begun to flicker. And if you don't go past just having church to becoming the man and the woman of God you were created to be, the future will seem impossible. So in the midst of fluctuation and flickering light and limited sight, in this adverse flickering light, God says, Samuel, Samuel, Samuel has laid down for the evening. He's a young man laying in what's comfortable. Samuel is resting in his own comfort. But a call is a disruption of comfort. Samuel. And Samuel could hear the call. And he got up and went to Eli because Samuel thinks it's about his mentor. And Eli didn't hear anything. Eli says, I called thee not. Go back and lay down again. All of this is happening in the flicker of life. Samuel tries to get comfortable again. And about the time he's about to go to sleep, God says, Samuel. to Eli because he wants to be faithful. He said, did you call me, sir? Eli is old. And he says, I called thee not. Go back and lay down again. 
Yes, sir. I'm seeking my own comfort. I'm doing my own thing my way. I do me like I do me. I go where I want to go. I wear what I want to wear. I say what I want to say. I'm comfortable. I'm a new generation. I make my own rules. I got my own plans. I'm fixing up my life like I want it to be. I'm living like it's golden. I'm doing my own thing. I come when I get ready to come. I leave when I want to leave because I'm keeping it comfortable. But your keeping it comfortable is killing what's going to happen next. So God says, Samuel. Did you call me? And then Eli perceives. He, he can't hear it anymore, but he can still sense it. Look at this process, this process of transition. There's a process of transition. There's a generational process of transition. There's a miscommunication between generations. Look at, look, look at it, look at it. Eli's sending him back. Eli's rejecting Samuel. Samuel has to face the rejection of Eli and lay in the comfort of his own rebellion. And yet God keeps calling him, Samuel. Eli perceives that the Lord has called him. He says, go back and lay down. Only this time, when you hear the call, say, speak, Lord. For thy servant, thy servant, thy servant heareth the call. And the reason, the reason, the reason, when, when, when Samuel goes back and he lays down on the bed again, he is now armed with what Eli has given him. We have something to give you. We're left in the earth to pass it on. The question, my, my spiritual father said something to me that I had to grow into understanding. Somebody said to him, will you be my spiritual father? And you know how Bishop Walker said, Bishop Walker said, baby. <laughs> the question is not, can I be your father? I've already proven that I can be a father. The question is, can you be my son? That's the part that has to be proven. If Samuel had not obeyed Eli, then the rest of the Bible would have never happened. Out of Samuel's direction, wars were fought and won. Kingdoms were conquered. Kings were anointed. Out of Samuel's call, came David's call to ministry. Out of David's call to ministry came the lineage of Jesus Christ. Out of Jesus Christ came the New Testament apostles. Out of the apostles came the power of the Holy Ghost reign over the church. All of the Bible was waiting on Samuel to say the right thing that he could only get from Eli to break the yoke that was over his life. And God did it all in flickering light. I'm going to close with this. The Lord told me to tell you, don't wait for the light to stop flickering. Don't wait for the stability you crave. Don't wait to feel like you're ready for what's next. Don't wait till the conditions are right and the circumstances are all in place. 
because we walk by faith and not by sight where God is getting ready to take you next is in flickering light and I told God I said when I get to the end of this Lord I think I will call for the people under 40 because I want to anoint the next generation and I do and I do but the Lord said the strangest thing to me he said you cannot determine the next generation by age because I, I have some late bloomers who are just coming into their season in the second phase of their life and, and they're just now about to step into what they should have been into 20 years ago. And now they're starting to hear things and it's all starting to make sense. He says, so don't call next by age. Call next by opportunity. He said, I want you to pray for the people that are on the verge of an opportunity that is about to be birthed in flickering light and everything's shaking around you and everything's moving around you and yet there is a call on your life. I've got something to tell you. I've got something to pass over to you. I've got something to will you. I've got something to convey over to you. If you are standing on the verge of something, right on the edge of something, and you can't see details, and everything is flickering a little bit, and you're wondering, do you have what it takes? And you're still wrestling between your comfort and your call. Sometimes you're in your call, and sometimes you're in your comfort. I have a warrant for your rest. The time of you flickering back and forth between call and comfort is over. This is the beginning of a new moment of direction and purpose and call and glory in your life. I don't know who you are. You might be 20. You might be 52. You might be 31. You might be 45. But if you feel like you're about to come into something and you're a little bit scared and you're a little bit nervous and you're a little bit unstable, this is your message. This is God's word for this people at this time. You might be watching online, but you can still catch this anointing that I'm going to send to you today right where you are on your couch. I want you to start worshiping God in your kitchen. Somebody start worshiping him right now. I'm going to put you on the spot. Can I put you on the spot, Oscar? Let me put you on the spot. Only if you're comfortable. I want to talk about the conversation we had about gospel artists versus being who you became. Can I do that? Okay. You can't say no, I got you out of here. <laughs> I didn't know I was going to do do. He says to me, you know, I love gospel music. I want to be a gospel artist. And, and I had nothing wrong with being a gospel artist. It's a great thing to be. He was operating in that lane. I said, that's fine. You can do that. That's a great job. We need gospel artists. We need, we need all of that. I said, but nobody goes to college for eight years to be a gospel artist. Nobody who can direct symphonies and write for orchestras does that so they can be a gospel artist. I tried to make you see who you are and what you can do. And, and this year, <laughs> he didn't see who he was. He didn't see who it could be. 
he was shooting too low. He was shooting based on what he saw around him. I said, why would you settle for that when you can write for symphonies, you can travel around the world, you can be an ambassador into areas that being a gospel artist would never be able to take you. Your mama suffered and did without for you to be more than just somebody who can sing and can play. You're bigger than all of your doubts. You're bigger than all of your fears. That's why I had to come and watch you get your doctorate. Ah! You don't know who you are. You don't know what you can do. You don't know what you can be. You don't know what you can have. You don't know what you can reach. Don't settle for what you saw. God will do more with you than he did with the people who inspired you. Lift your hands and open your mouth and get ready. The anointing of God is in this place. The Spirit of God is in this room. There is an impartation taking place in this room. I want you to stop your inconsistency. Stop your struggle. Change your strategy. Focus yourself. Get your mind ready. Get your house ready. Get your heart ready. Not many days hence, God is going to release his purpose and his destiny in your life. He's been getting you ready all of your life. It is about to happen. Open your mouth and give I was walking down the hallway one day. I ran in April, we were talking. And she was telling me, she said, uh, uh, I just love music, I love to sing, I love that. I said, that's wonderful. You got a beautiful voice, amazing voice, keep singing. You ought to always sing. You ought to sing in your sleep, you ought to wake up singing. You ought to sing while you're brushing your teeth. You ought to keep on singing. But why did you get a master's degree in business administration? If all you was gonna do was sing, you could have come out of, you could have got a GED and been able to sing. And I said, you need to increase your vision of how you see yourself. And while I'm yet flickering, you don't see, you don't see, ow. You don't even see, you don't even understand, you don't even realize. Can you hear me? Part of house. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Can you hear me? My God. The stage is set. The table is spread. And God said, in the flickering light of your era, the flickering light of your church, the flickering in your own insecurities, none of it will stop me from calling you. Samuel! 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 
You ain't been listening. What are you supposed to say when God says, Samuel? Speak, Lord. Speak, Lord, for thy servant hear it. Throw your hand up and say, Speak, Lord, for thy servant hear it. I hear you, Lord. I hear you, Lord. I hear you, Lord. Speak, Lord. Speak, Lord. is in this place. The glory of the Lord is in this place. You got your heart open. You got your hands open. You got your heart open. You got your head open. That's normally, that's normally where we leave you, with your hands up and your heart open but I'm gonna push you. Open up your head. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Open up your head. The way you see it is not the way it is. What God wants to do with you is bigger than what you've been aiming at. I appreciate your appreciation for where you are, but what God wants to do is bigger than what you have in mind. The great question for you is, are you willing to be uncomfortable? Are you willing to go scared and uncertain? Do you understand that you are on the precipice of the rest of your life? You cannot rewrite your history, but you can affect your destiny. You don't have another day to waste crying about yesterday when God gave you today so you could change tomorrow. Come out of your sleep. And the Lord told me to tell you, if you would wake up, if you would stop playing games and wake up, God would amaze you. I preach this message to you in flickering light. Many of my dear friends are fading away. Alzheimer's setting in. Physical infirmity slowing them down. God in his mercy has left me strong. I did this when I was you. If I had to do it now, it'd have been too late. Don't you miss this moment. Don't you miss this moment because you were scared. I was scared every day. Don't you miss this moment because you're uncertain. Faith thrives in uncertainty. We will watch you as long as we can. <laughs> we will guide you as long as we can. But this is your moment. And don't you let no devil in hell stop you. You hear me? Don't you let no devil in hell stop you. Some will subdue nations. Some will rise into positions of power. Some will rise into powers of financial uh, uh, giftedness and profitability beyond your imagination. Some of you will do incredible things, but let me tell the rest of you, you don't have to be big to be great. Some of you will raise 
world-shaking children. Some of you will touch the person who touches the world. You'll heal the people that rock the nations. You'll minister to people that subdue kingdoms. And the devil's job is to try to make you think that whatever you got is insignificant if you don't read it on the front page of the paper. But the press does not define greatness. Everybody famous is not great. And everybody great is not famous. And so don't look for the bright lights. <laughs> Don't look for the bright lights, because I know people in the bright lights. I know people in the bright lights that are committing suicide. I know people in the bright lights who are strung out on drugs. I know people in the bright lights who have lost their mind. I know people in the bright lights that you can't trust with a nickel or leave alone with a child. Don't look for the bright lights. Your destiny is not in the bright lights. Your destiny is not in the bright lights. Your destiny is not in the bright lights. Stop feeling bad about yourself because people have not discovered you, acknowledged you, accepted you, blessed you, or increased you. Your destiny is not my children in the bright lights. Your destiny is in the flickering lights. I feel like we all have a candle. We all have this light that we're given to carry. That light is your destiny. This is what I tell people. Exposure is so important. If you see it, that means you can do it. That means you can do it. That means you can do it. If you are not in the room where changes are occurring, you are in the yard where consequences are received. Be in the room. Be in the room.